Hi everyone and welcome to the Changing Tides podcast. In each episode, we invite guests to have honest conversations about their mental health journeys with the goal of destigmatizing mental health within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Due to the nature of the podcast, we'll be discussing a variety of mental health topics and possibly triggering experiences. While we and the majority of our guests are not trained professionals, we encourage you to practice self-care while listening and seek professional guidance if you or a loved one is in need of support. With that said, let's start the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Changing Tides podcast. I am your host, Matthew Yonamura. Today is another installment of our Uprisers Family Drive series where we interviewed all these guests live on location at the Uprisers Family Drive last year. And it's been a really great series for me because I've been able to go back, listen to these interviews and kind of remember the great conversations that I got to have with these folks. Because honestly, it was kind of a whirlwind for me because it was just interview after interview. Some of these people I was meeting for the very first time Uh, day of on location so it's just really cool to go back and listen to these as I edit these and put them out for streaming platforms but again if you want to go and listen to the whole thing uh, uninterrupted you definitely can (laughs) you can go to the Changing Tides YouTube channel and then go to under the live section but I'm also uploading the video version of all of these again as well um, as separate episodes so yeah i'm really excited for you guys to listen to this one if you didn't tune into the live recording uh we have two really great content creators joining me to kind of just discuss what it's like for them and their own unique experiences as asian creators um they both come in with different experiences as creators you know one experiencing more hate than the other one uh going more fashion forward in their content And, you know, I think it's just really cool to get the behind the scenes and kind of the inside baseball point of view of these content creators. So I'm not doing their content justice with this introduction. I I just think you need to check them out. And I think you need to just listen to the words themselves. So with that, I'm so excited to introduce the two guests of this episode, Jeff Yamazaki and Ryan Holmes. All right, I think we're back. Looks like audio's on. Uh, music has been thumping since like the last interview, so you know it might be a little distracting. I was hearing some Beyonce, like kind of trying to keep track of where it was in the song, but no, we're good. We're good. I think the audio's coming through good. So, um, you know, we're just doing four, forty-minute interviews with groups of two so far. Uh, we had Rakeem on earlier as one of the designers. We just had Yellow Chair Collective as a mental health organization, and now some of our we're trying to do like based on like um, style of why you guys are here. And now we have yeah. like some creators here, you know. Yeah. So we're just we have forty minutes. I'm gonna try to keep myself at a minimum, even though I've been blabbering on this whole time. But please <laughs> introduce you, yourselves and uh, the work you guys do. Uh, uh, Ryan Alexander Holmes, um, content creator, actor. Uh, I make a lot of content just based in family and, and cultural values, and I talk about like some controversial topics, not controversial to me, but to the world. <laughs> right. And uh, I use humor sort of to educate and, and disarm people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeff Yamazaki. Uh, mainly men's fashion content creator. Been doing that full time this year, and I've been doing it for maybe the last three years, starting from wow. the pandemic. And then before then, I was kind of a corporate guy doing accounting, uh, stereotypical, you know, <laughs> studying, studying hard, studying for my CPA, and then uh, doing the corporate work for about like six, seven years. And then now I'm full time creating content, being creative. Wow. That's a so, flex yeah. to, have, <laughs> to to be a CPA and then like, oh no, I'm full time male fashion. <laughs> Model and creator, yeah, that's dope. What about you? Did you go straight into acting <clears throat> no, and content? No, I majored in business. Okay. <laughs> I went to Berkeley, I majored in business. I worked for my dad's law firm for a bit. Every summer I work uh, at an internship in a financial firm. Wow. And I didn't like any of it <laughs> at all. And I was trying so hard to pretend that I wanted to do it. Um, and it didn't work. So uh, eventually I moved to New York and I told my parents I was going to work on Wall Street. Because I had a bunch of friends that worked on Wall Street. And a part of me believed that. 
But as soon as I got there and I, I sat on trading floors and I sat at desks with my friends that worked there and I saw their team, I was just like, there's no way I could do it. <laughs> no way. There's no way I'm shouting into a phone <laughs> about crunching numbers and selling stock. And then I just, no, no, no shade to the people that are in that yeah. business still because I still have really good friends that do that. But I didn't feel like I was contributing to the world and I didn't feel like this is what I want to do mm-hmm. in my life. So I started uh, getting into the arts. I started modeling. I signed with a modeling agency out there. I started working doing that. Um, I told them I wanted to get into acting, so they got me a commercial agent, started going out for commercials. And in this one commercial audition, I thought I did really well, but the casting director took me to the side, and she was like, I thought she was going to be like, you got it, you were so amazing, we love you, I've never seen an actor so good. She took me to the side, she's like, I don't know what that was, (laughs) but you need to like go to class and like figure out, you know, if you really want to do this, because I can see that you're so passionate about it. But I don't know what the hell I just saw. Oh, like, go take some classes. So I really took that to heart. Yeah. And I thanked her. I was like, thank you. Because, shit, I guess I was delusional. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, coming from such a scholastic background, I was like, well, I, I don't want to go to the studios where, like, anyone can co- sort of go to that. I want to go to, like, a prestigious, like, program. So I auditioned for all the top schools, like Juilliard and uh, Yale uh, UCLA's drama school program, a bunch of schools in, in London. And I got into USC. Mm. And so I treated that like, because I was an athlete, I treated that like, I was, it was so, program. yeah, I was so serious. Yeah. Like it was 10, 10 to 10. I was reading like 10 plays a week, wow. watching 10 movies a week. Um, and so when I graduated from that, I was like, okay, I feel like I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. I feel like I know what I'm doing. And so that was like, I graduated like five years ago and I've been on, shows and and done movies and now I create content and and I realized how important that drama school was to my Mm. creation of content too yeah Yeah. I mean that Jeff Flux earlier but I don't know (laughs) that was a fuck (laughs) I mean not even the acting stuff you you said you said Berkeley you said then you moved to New York I don't know I say it's a flex because like he has a CPA (laughs) my parents would be so impressed by (laughs) that's what I think of I have a feeling we'll be getting back to the the parent approval thing of course, yeah, in this conversation, of course. but of course. to kind of kick things off and bring it back, you know, to to why we're I'm meeting Luke Bolt here today. Family Drive. I have two questions I ask to kind of kick off these interviews and then do some follow ups and bounce off of that. But the first thing I want to ask you both is, you know, what does the Family Drive mean to you and to be a part of it today? Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, it's seeing all. Oh, it's my first time the Uprisers Family Drive is. Second year, right? Mm-hmm. But even as second year, it was amazing to see all of this whole community come together all at once. And then, you know, some people might come here for like the charity work or maybe for the workshop or uh, just to meet new people. But I think just having that event to have everyone come in for a little, you know, to, to experience everything all at once, yeah. I think is very important. And sometimes just going to a charity event is not as like exciting for some people. So having this type of unique yeah. event is very unique and for me it's like me personally I it's hard for me to get out of my house I'm like kind of a <laughs> homebody <laughs> and so having this type of dynamic event makes me want to come out mm-hmm. and I think it makes me feel good mm-hmm. makes like feeling all these positive vibes from everyone mm-hmm. it means a lot to me to be able to feel that and kind of spread that yeah. happiness with one another so it means a lot to be to be here I had everything he said but also like it, it's so important to to be a part of a community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I'm mixed. I'm, I'm African-American and Chinese. I think growing up, I didn't feel that outside of my own household. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because people were like, well, you're not... I always felt like, oh, yeah, you've heard this so many times, but like people who are mixed are like, oh, you're not black enough, you're not Chinese enough. But for me, being raised like super Chinese, mm. I, mm. I did, and I know so much about the culture, I never had anyone to share that with outside of my house. Because I didn't think that anyone would believe me or oh, wow. sort of accept me. So these past few years of creating content and showing who I am and, and finding my voice and sharing that unapologetically mm-hmm. has brought me to this community of people who are the same. Yeah, right? And and what's funny is sometimes I'll meet uh, other Chinese people, and the Chinese Americans, and they'll be like, why do you know more about Chinese culture <laughs> than me or like know the language better than me? And I'm like, I never mm-hmm. thought that any a Chinese person would say that to me right because I always felt like I was not like no matter what I'd learned about Chinese culture no matter how well I learned the language mm-hmm. that that I was always beneath mm-hmm. those other people that like looked 
mm. people said they looked Chinese. Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me, I'm, I'm like, it's not that I don't look Chinese. It's just you've never seen a Chinese person like me before. You know, it's a, rep- it's a problem with representation. It's a problem with the understanding of what diversity looks like. Yeah. Um, so this community, I feel completely accepted by. And the message behind the, the, the family drive is exactly that. Yeah. You know, when that one of those first things you said really struck me, <clears throat> where you felt like you had to validate yourself as a Chinese American. Yeah, like yeah. you felt like you didn't belong, even yeah. though it's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can only imagine <laughs> like that, because, you know, not feeling black enough, not feeling Chinese enough. Like I could only imagine like, Feeling that in yourself, you know, not mm-hmm. just with your acceptance to other groups, yeah. but feeling that within your own identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel, <clears throat> what I feel now, too, is that um, I am sharing this not just for me, but sharing it for other people that are going through similar situations that I'm going through in terms of identity, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'll get these <laughs> these messages that, like, make me hella emotional of, of people who aren't necessarily even black and Asian, but are just mixed and they're in an environment that they feel like doesn't accept them. And they're like, mm-hmm. thank you for showing me that. Like, I actually don't need to get, like, the stamp of approval from other people to act like who I already am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's actually common <clears throat> sense. Yeah. All right. But the environment sometimes will tell you who you will, if you're not careful, will tell you who you are and you'll allow it to tell you who you are. You know? Yeah. Well, I feel the same, yeah. same way, like, as a Japanese American yeah. uh, growing up. In my community, there were a decent amount of Asians in my community, but growing up, I was with all the like the white kids, mm-hmm. and I always felt like I needed to fit in. Yeah, I'm sure everyone has that similar yeah. stories, like from elementary school to middle school. I didn't have any like, Asian representation in media, and that's when I realized yeah. when like Crazy Rich Asians came out, I'm like, whoa, this is like something changed inside me. Yeah, and then I started listening to like K-pop and more J-pop and mm-hmm. kind of diving deep into my Japanese culture and although I was able to speak Japanese as a kid because my parents taught me at a young age I still had that trouble growing up of am I American or am I Japanese and having that conundrum all throughout my life and I think it's only been recent maybe like late 20s or 30s where I'm like really embracing and it's because of people like Ryan um, and this community be like you you know you could be Japanese American both at the same time right that's another thing like looking at your content I'm like oh yeah I've never really got to see this before mm-hmm. like I didn't see that growing up mm-hmm. we didn't have <laughs> Japanese Americans on TV <laughs> right. expressing who they really are not like some buddy wrote this stereotypical yeah. version of like who they think a Japanese American is and totally. then making them act in it <laughs> Sure. You know, like times have changed a lot. Yeah. I think social media usually sometimes gets a bad rap, mm-hmm. but like it actually is a really powerful tool right. for people to express themselves and okay. then for other people to see themselves reflected. Mm-hmm. It's really lucky because, you know, through some of the creators I've met through Up- Uprisers, I see that that side of social media, of the empowerment of these yeah. different voices you normally wouldn't hear. Right. And one thing about, um, you know, Asian Americans on screen or Japanese people on screen. My dad, you know, he's old school. Well, not super old school. He's actually pretty progressive. But, like, when it comes to media, he's like, the last samurai. That's yeah, the one. And it's like, yeah. but it's Tom Cruise uh-huh. as the oh, white oh, savior. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah, you're seeing the culture. You're right. seeing... You I know, thought you... Uh, for some reason, I was like, I thought you said seven samurai. Oh, yeah. Well, that would have that worked. That would have worked yeah. a bit, quite a bit better. But yeah. the last samurai, you know, it's like, that's that was his... It still is, like, his movie. Mm-hmm. But it's like... <laughs> It's the White Savior. Right, 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 right. And even that movie, me and my whole family went out to go watch that yeah, in the theater. Yeah, exactly, right? It's not a bad movie, <laughs> yeah. though, but it's definitely a White Savior. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, first question was the family drive. You both had really great responses. And I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm seeing kind of hinting at, you know, the, the next question I have, which is, uh, when would you say your mental health journey began? And I feel like, when, especially when it came to identity, it sounds like it started early for you both. But, you know, I think... You could say that it started around that time, but when would you say you were conscious of your mental health journey? Um, I, I would say in college mm-hmm. when I was an athlete and then I got injured mm-hmm. and I was no longer could, because I was like <clears throat> All-American Junior Olympic champion in track and field and going into uh, college, I was like, I'm going to Olympics. I'm going to go to London. I'm going to compete. <laughs> and then I got hurt. And then it's like, well, now my whole world, I don't know what I'm yeah. doing. 
because I can't come back. Yeah. I herniated just in my spine. I oh, slightly man. tore like my hamstring, and I just could not come back. I kept getting injured. Then your mind starts to be like, well, who the fuck am I? Mm. <laughs> who am I if I'm not an Olympic athlete? And yeah. this has been my whole life. Yeah. And so I really, I think it really started then. But that, <clears throat> it wasn't, it took culture, culture didn't come into the mental health aspect until like three years ago. Oh, really? Um, mm. the, the injury got me into the arts, oh. right? And I think arts, the arts, how I viewed them before was like, I'm not the geeky ass theater kid. <laughs> the geeky ass theater kids in high school. No. But then I realized, like, oh, I probably had more in common with the theater kids than I did with the jocks. I just never mm-hmm. allowed myself to to actually accept that. Yeah. And then through the arts, it's been a very healing process for me, especially at USC, where we had to really dive into like who we were and accept all the parts of us, even the parts that we thought were rotten. Yeah. And the part the parts that I thought were rotten sharing that in front of witnesses you know my classmates and we did a solo show where we talked about like wow. one, of, one of our traumatic experiences in life and we had to share that wow i was like oh i didn't die hmm. and i don't i feel better actually because now i'm not carrying this burden that i thought was like you know asians repressed a mm-hmm. lot of their emotions like i was like oh all these emotions that are depressing i realized that was not a big deal actually yeah and so yeah to answer your question started when I got injured as an athlete, and then it's still continuing, but I feel like I've come so far, and it's not no longer a stigma in my mind, and I'm not afraid to share what I've gone through with people, and I don't take myself that seriously either. Mm-hmm. It's always like there's always humor there too. Yeah, I don't just start break down crying. <laughs> like I'll laugh even sometimes when I get emotional because I'm like, damn, like I really did not allow myself to feel these emotions before, yeah. and now I do, and that's freeing and it's liberating. And it's also kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. That's a great perspective. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, for me, I, I think I've had social anxiety uh, like issues ever since I was a kid. Very, very young. I still remember. Um, I was a kid. I never like raised my hand in mm-hmm. class. And I was so timid. So always anxiety induced, um, like self inflicted, like always like issues mentally all the time. And I thought it was just normal. Uh, I thought, like, everyone was going right. through it. Like, oh, yeah, you're the kid that doesn't want to like, raise your hand. But there's always that other kid that, you know, gets to speak his mind very mm-hmm. well. And then that was all through elementary, middle school, high school, college. And I just thought it was just just my personality. And so yeah. I didn't really do anything about it. Yeah. And even through college, even after college, first job, I didn't do any, uh, like, audit of my mental health for a very long time. But then I started to realize, like, me keeping everything to myself because I'm very, even to this day, I like I keep a lot of things inside. But recently, in my late twenties, um, I'm starting to feel like your friend groups are becoming becoming smaller. Your friends and family are becoming more important. And if you just keep everything inside you, you know, there's nothing. There's no real connection. And I'm starting to realize that. You know, it's pretty late, like late twenties. I'm starting to realize, oh man, it's like I can't keep everything inside me. And um, ever since uh, I realized, like, oh, this is something I have to work on, and it's, I think it's been a long journey that I just haven't really tackled. And I think a lot of Asians don't even tackle it in their whole life <laughs> their at whole all, life. you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm thankful that yeah. I started at least. <clears throat> and I think um, more people, like, in the Asian community, uh, yeah. I'm sure you said, like, the previous um, interviewees were, like, mental health. Yeah, they're both therapists, the right. yeah. And, like, people like them, I'm sure there weren't that many back in the day. I didn't, and, I didn't know any. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and I just recently went to, like, been going to a therapist and stuff like that recently, and it's been really helpful just, yeah. like, talking. Yeah. And, like, I never had the opportunity to have, like, an undisrupted one-hour talk mm-hmm. and getting, like, kind of forced to talk, mm-hmm. and that has really helped kind of open my mind yeah. and kind yeah. of, yeah. Like start my mental health journey in that way. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because it, with the last group, Yellow Chair Collective, they're, they're a collective of Asian therapists mm-hmm. that specialize in Asian clients, right? Mm-hmm. And when they first started it, uh, the creator of Linda, they were told, like, it's not going to happen. There's not enough clients out there. Mm-hmm. But just because, like, th- what they said, and I think what we're kind of noticing as we all like kind of mature and come to terms with mental health is that the need is there. We just kind of don't have the words to describe it i feel right. like so one thing i could really resonate with is is the the social anxiety um 
I, I didn't know at a young age that me always tapping my leg or mm-hmm. my inability to sleep because my brain would never shut off, you mm-hmm. know? Like, those things are all anxiety, but you're not really mm-hmm. taught that verbiage mm-hmm. or that that's what it means. You always think of it as the chest tightness. Mm-hmm. That's what you always think anxiety yep. is, but it comes out in so many different ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, for both of you, like, when it comes to putting yourselves out there, because I could, I could tell that, <laughs> like, when it comes to putting yourselves out there, like, how, how do you kind of, you know, have the confidence or how, how do you get past the anxiety or do you just kind of have to fight through it you know man i i that 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 idea was with me all through high school college and after just my first job like i need to get out of this shell Mm. and i was so stuck in like oh i gotta just be within myself be like nervous all the time and then one day i was like all right i'm gonna go to a toastmasters oh uh, yeah i heard yeah speaking yes Uh, yes and i just signed up with like the i live in koreatown so there's a koreatown group Toastmasters oh, wow. I literally forced myself to yes. sign up even yes. just like signing up was really hard yes. and then once that email comes in it's like oh you're you're signed up you better come yeah. and then I went the first time and my armpits were sweaty yeah. and I was like yeah. all the oh, reactions wow. were coming yeah. Dude. and then the first Toastmasters I didn't say a single word like <laughs> I feel like a lot of people wouldn't and then it took like three or four sessions yeah. to um, kind of there's like a way it helped they help you because all you the least you could do is just like say your name and that like kind of helps you get over that that hump and just being able to do that uh-huh. it, it like changed my thinking it's like oh you survived one yes. toastmaster you and survived it, two toastmasters it feels like you're surviving yeah surviving yes and then that really helped me gain the confidence to be like okay if someone asked me to do a public speaking i have a better understanding of my feeling yeah. my social anxiety so okay, i just have to get over that fact yeah and start even like this podcast like i was nervous but I think that's like a healthy nervousness. Mm, but yes. I'm confident like I could come in here and like yes. talk. It's not a through. debilitating right. nervousness. Yeah. Mm. Which is like what I had right, before right. too. I I used to have panic attacks before I would uh, post content. Mm. Oh really? <laughs> not even like there's no one there. Like I would have panic attacks. Uh-huh. I feel like that's the most Yeah. I feel like that's when you would have the most because you're alone. It mm. feels Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, you don't have anyone mean. to bounce that idea off of. Yeah. Mm. And, and, I feel and, like, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no, you're not interrupting. That's totally valid. I, I was so, in, as an Asian, like, you want to save face all the time. <laughs> yes. And you want to, like, you actually care so much about what other people think. Yeah. And I think that, like, that male stoicism, mm. and maybe not even just male stoicism, just stoicism in the Asian community mm-hmm. comes from that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't come from, like, I'm actually strong. Right. right you know? Right. It, I mean, some people have seen some <laughs> shit and gone through some shit. But it's, like, a lot of it, I think, is based off of, like, don't show them anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Because then you won't be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And then they'll think that you're strong. Yeah. Like, are you actually strong? I don't know. So I I had the same thing. Like, I took, I forced myself to take a public speaking class Mm -hmm. two semesters Mm -hmm. at at Berkeley when I went to Berkeley. And that was the most nervous I've ever been in my whole life. And then I went to drama school. (laughs) And then I had to, like, I, I, dude, the way that it manifests in my body is I start shaking. Mm. And I I would be shaking and trying to, like, cover it up that I'm shaking. (laughs) And it would just keep getting worse. And I remember my my, uh, teacher said he did, the same thing happened to him. He's like, you just got to accept it. Mm -hmm. You got to accept that you're shaking. And he was like, once you start to accept it and accept the fear and then you sort of go through that and you mm-hmm. still do the thing that you're supposed to do and you survive that, mm-hmm. you just get more and more used to it. It's just like anything. It's right. like basketball players. Like the more you practice free throws, the better you get at mm-hmm. it. So that made me understand that like, oh, you just keep going keep through going, it. Yeah. Yeah. And like at least now I have the idea that like I'm going to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Right. Before I was just like, it's always going to be this way or I can't even think about the future because I'm just so worried about mm-hmm. how bad this is going to go. And like, ah, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. now it's just like, oh, I'm shaking. Uh-huh. Okay, well, it's crazy because mm-hmm. it's weird because when I do the thing, I'm just going to be myself and yeah. it's fine. Right. I also think that learning how to be myself and learning that that's okay, and even if I do say something embarrassing, to accept it in the moment mm. and to admit it and be like, yeah, that was kind of yeah, I'm working on that part. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's hard. And though, then you just, there. It, but the, the thing, the, another thing too is like the stopping the elongation of the feeling of embarrassment and mm-hmm. the feeling of, mm. of like beating down on yourself for something that you just said. Mm-hmm. It's just like, right. accept that you said that shit. Right. <laughs> accept that it was embarrassing in the moment. Call it out for everyone to see and then keep pushing, mm-hmm. you know? Right, it, right. It's helped me so much. And, and now I just don't really get 
nervous, but when I do get nervous, I'm still like, oh, I'm fine. Right, like, yeah. It's going to be fine. And, and even if someone starts to see it, then I'll just say it. I'm nervous. Mm-hmm. I'll just say it out loud. Right. I'll be mean, like, I'm literally shaking right now because mm-hmm. I'm with this person that is a hero of mine and I'm on a panel. This is crazy. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to get through this. Right. Right. You know? And most of the time we get through it. We get through it. Most of the time. You like, what do you mean? <laughs> What's going to happen? Are we going to burst yeah. into flames? <laughs> are we going to, you know, it pass always, out? It always right. works out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I think that that teacher gave you amazing advice because yeah. that's something I've learned through therapy is it's like I, told, I went to therapy hoping to get rid of anxiety. Yeah. She was like, sorry, but that's yeah. not, <laughs> that's not how it works. works. <laughs> it's like sometimes, it's like sometimes you have to learn that on occasion, anxiety is a good thing. Yeah. In the sense that it's like, oh, if I'm anxious about this presentation, this meeting, this this discussion, I need to prep more. That's mm-hmm. what it's yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. If it's, you know, about an event that we're hosting, that means maybe I need to go through the steps, make sure we have everything set. So sometimes it could be a good thing. Sometimes it is debilitating. Yeah. But like yeah. learning to learning to turn it into action or learning to live with it, as you said, yeah. it could go – you just have to kind of figure out what works for you and how to turn it into yeah. something mm-hmm. or just maybe reduce it so it's not the, the, the debilitating type of thing. That's right. the most right. courageous thing that I see is like people continue going forward with doing something even though they're like insanely anxiety stricken and uh-huh. nervous and right. shaking. Like yeah. that is the most right. courageous shit that I... <laughs> and most of the time like the person who's talking who's scared is thinking oh like People that are watching me, oh, yeah. they're gonna hate me. Yeah, 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 like, oh, yeah. stupid looking. And they don't think either way. Either you know, way, it's like, like, oh man, this person listen. is gutsy and yeah. doing it. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So speaking of that, because you know that's something like let's say it's a stand-up comic that's someone that you're talking directly to. But for you both, you know, when it comes specifically to social media, because I know you do in-person stuff too. But when it comes to yeah. social media, there's hate comments. But oh, yeah. what's you know, I feel like. What what's because what, I I want to discuss that maybe but like yeah. I feel like the stuff that you say to yourself is probably way more brutal than what people are saying to you. <laughs> yeah. right? Oh my god, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. I'll be I will literally say out loud by myself when the shit when I start talking shit to myself. I'll be like, stop doing that. I'll say that out loud. <laughs> oh, no, because I'm just like, what are you doing, man? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Why are you talking shit to yourself? Right. Uh-huh. You know, but it it it's so ingrained I think in a lot of us mm-hmm. that right. if you don't check that voice, yeah. It'll turn into something, and I think right. that's the value of community too. Because, because mm. you'll, I could have a conversation with you about how I was talking shit to myself, and you'd be like, "I do the same thing," and I'd right. be like, "Oh, yeah. we should probably not do that." Right? <laughs> yeah. But at least I'm not alone. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. But I do get. I don't know. You get hate comments? Uh, not, not, not really. Yeah, but I'm sure. I get so you're, many. You get really? Because <laughs> I'm talking about like race. Oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I'm talking about like affirmative action. And I'm talking about sometimes. I oh no! Imagine you talking about your own experience. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 what's it's different now than it was before. Uh-huh. I remember when I first, like I made a whole, the reason why I even started creating content was because like uh, BLM was happening during COVID and Stop Asian Hate and then they started beefing with each other and I saw right. so many black people and Asian people mm-hmm. arguing with each other right. and like saying vile things to each other and I was like, guys, what are you doing? Like I'm here, I'm both <clears throat> and I right. coexist with my family. Like, So I, I talked about anti-blackness in the Asian community and I called out, like, the Asian community for their anti-blackness. Yeah. And I said, like, if you guys feel some type of way about that, just know, and you try to attack me, just know that you're attacking a fellow Asian. Right. And, like, you're racist. Uh, <laughs> and I thought that that post would actually get, like, 99%, like, hate. Uh-huh. But it was, like, 99% support wow. from the Asian community. Uh-huh. And then 1% of uh, people calling me the N-word and oh, saying man. I'm a monkey and... And, yeah. and I rec- responded to every single one of those comments, mm-hmm. which was not healthy. Because <laughs> there was like 20,000 comments. <laughs> and I remember wow. sometimes it would work and I would, someone said, someone sent like this video of these two black guys harassing this Asian woman at a counter at their store. And he's like, you're the kind of bitch that wouldn't stand up for this woman. And I was like, uh, I would. <laughs> and I would stand up for you if you were, if... Even if, even though you called me a bitch, I would still stand up for you. Yeah. He was shook. He's like, oh. <laughs> like, what do you, what do you, who do you think you're talking to? Like, yeah. why? And then I started realizing in their brains that they already see me as a certain type of way before I even have said anything. Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, well, that's not actually his fault. Mm. That's not actually these people's fault. How can I attack it at the source? And how can I educate people to show them? 
that like this idea of what a black person is to them is actually not real. It's been conditioned into them. And really it's just like showing me enjoying my time with my, my little Chinese grandma. And they're like, what the fuck? Those are awesome videos. Yeah, and they're just like, huh? And I didn't, I never thought that that could be like revolutionary, that that could be transformative for people in their minds. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it's not actually that hard to create content and to create content that matters, especially when you finally embrace who you are and you want to show that you're not afraid to. Right. You know? So, I mean, I don't, I think we're good on time, but to bring it kind of together again, um, because, you know, what you're both talking about in your stories. And then I know you guys are talking later today at Family Drive, but <clears throat> what brings you both together here at Family Drive? Like, why, why are we putting you both in the same room with me for some reason? Like, <laughs> like, what, like what is your work together? I mean, I mean, when I met Jeff, we instantly connected. Uh-huh. I don't know if I can articulate necessarily why. Well, I can. I mean, it's like we both are in the same space. We're both in... Yeah, I definitely can. We're both in the same space of sort of creating content, but not all influencers are the same. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Do you oh, know what I'm saying? Oh, right. Like some people do this. We could name drop, but I'll, I'll yeah, be, I'm yeah, not gonna name no names. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But it's like when I meet an influencer who is grounded and who's who's doing these things for like self discovery mm-hmm. and sort of like uplifting their community, and that's important to them. It's an immediate connection, mm-hmm. and that's how I felt when right, I met Jeff. Right. And I think we have the same life experiences in yeah. terms of like growing an Asian family in yeah. America and kind of connecting in those little aspects of life and going to like a good school and then trying to figure out what you have to want to do, appease your parents yeah. and then <laughs> want to do your artistic goals and do all these things. And I feel like whenever we talk, we're like, oh, yeah, I felt the same way. Oh, yeah, I did the same thing after college. Uh, and it's this connection that I really yeah. feel with Ryan and a lot of the frankly a lot of the people here yeah, that I meet it's community. like always so many like similarities within one another right? it's it, and it's I guess it's like when you ask that question it's it's almost like I don't know but it's actually we say that because this has never existed before mm-hmm. right not because we don't actually have anything in common and that we're really connected we've just never had a space like this where people like us can come together right do you know what I mean? Yeah, and just and it, and talk about it. Right? And talk yeah, about it, and it not be a superficial thing, which is like I can't be in those situations. Mm-hmm. I don't like being in those environments where it's just like you have a bunch of followers <laughs> and you do too. Talk. Yeah. I'm like I don't have anything in common with this person. Right. This is just a person who also has followers and creates content. Like, right. You didn't do any time ta- like due diligence to understand what we care about. Like I, yeah. I feel like I've seen some of those weird. Yeah. Some of those weird ones. That, but, but my favorite is is like on uh, TikTok now, they do like, they'll put people head to head on these lives. It'll be like the NPC girl <laughs> versus like a cook cook creator. Yeah. And they see who could get the most donations. And it's like, really? I'm like, I'm like, see, like that's for content. That's funny because oh, it's so random. But then I'll see random. some of these like, these panels where they put those people together on purpose, you know? So it's just like, yeah. it's, it's hard to find those types of people. Mm-hmm. So... But with that, like, what are you guys going to be presenting on later today? Uh, um, turning, using social media for good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I'll be talking about how to get started, more of the practical side of yeah. social media, how to get started, right. uh, whether it's you know, creating content, starting a new business, a career change uh, yeah. in that aspect. But also you, you're going to talk about overcoming sort of like the barriers mentally, emotionally, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Right. So I think with that, like, I think, that's, you know, using social media for good. You could, there's so much going on where I feel like you kind of have to pick your battles, right? Mm. So how do you, how do you pick what, what, you, I mean, not pick your battles because you want to fight for justice for all, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like, how do you decide, like, you know what, I really need to say something on this. I really need to say something on that. Mm. I think when I get an emotional reaction, yeah. like okay. a, a legit emotional reaction, then yes. I have to say something. If right. it's, if it's kind of passing, yes. then maybe... I might not say something because maybe I'm not, I'm not ready for it, mm-hmm. or I have not articulate enough to say something about it. But when this like emotion comes up deep inside me, then it's like, all right, that's ready to go. Let yes. me let me say something. Yes, and that that in part kind of heals me that I, I said something out loud and do something about it. And that's probably when or, yeah when I do say something about when that emotion comes up. Same, same. Like I got I gotta feel it. 
<clears throat> I got to be passionate about it. Right. I have to care about it. Indeed. And if I don't, I'm like, why am I talking about it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Is it hard to ever find the balance between like, you know, it, it's a business, right? right. Mm-hmm. But it's also like, this is truly what I feel. Like, how, yeah. how, like is it hard to find a balance between those two things? I would say there's always a way to talk about the issue mm-hmm. from a human place, from a compassionate place. Yeah. Like, you can always address some aspect of that issue yeah. in a way that is universal and that's also you're also passionate and care about it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to take a side. Like I am, I am the CEO of trying to find how where there's no sides because I'm because <laughs> I'm mixed. And right. I, can, like in a, especially in LA, like the Asian community and the Black community has have had contention with right. each other, but not in my household, <laughs> not in my, amongst my friend groups. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? But like there is this idea that they should because it's been conditioned to us through media. Totally. And you know what I mean? So I'm like, but that's not the, that's not the truth. Mm-hmm. So when I am approaching any situation, I'm like, what's the fucking truth? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to tell it from a human perspective. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, we did get the five minute sign, but yeah. what's, you know, what's on the horizons for you both? What, uh, is there anything to plug? Is there anything you want to make sure you say? Cause I, I, I didn't ask for any. I don't know if I answered enough questions, but is there anything else you need to? Uh, not much. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, just keep on grinding on the content train, which is <laughs> yeah. another topic. It's yeah. just a deep, endless pit yeah. uh, for creating content, which is. Oh wait, what were we talking about outside? We were like, oh, we could probably talk. Did we talk oh, about that? Oh, is it like the? the oh yeah, the honeymoon phase of creating content. Yes. And once that. Oh, that's something over. that we could talk about in the that's last awesome. five minutes, like. Um, uh, obsessing over the metrics, right? It's right? The, oh. the, the social media, the the burnout type of. Oh yeah, burnout. The burnout type of. Uh, and I was talking, I was thinking about it this morning, and it was like, I'm, I'm like, for me, uh, I, I do a ton of numbers on my content, and so since I was an accountant, I love numbers. Uh. So I have spreadsheets of all my content, <laughs> oh, shit. and then I have, I've been tracking my, my growth and my metrics since day one. Wow, oh, and then this is this month was my first month where I lost followers overall, mm. and I'm like, all right, this is the honeymoon phase is over mm. of my content growing, and I, I'm sure there's you know there's gonna be upsides in the down in the outside uh, after this, but just like the growth is over, like the big growth is over, and so I feel this like pressure of like yeah. needing to con- continue to create. Not long, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. And, like, <laughs> and whenever I talk about other creators, like yeah, dude, this is this is normal, but you have to get the, you have to to find a mindset that works for you because mm. everyone all creators go through this and some people you know they quit of the burnout of mm. continuing mm-hmm. but you need to find a way to progress through this like downside because there's a lot of ups and downs like so content many. has really highs low very low lows yes. and being able to get past that is so important i think also it's like <laughs> if you're checking your metrics every day yeah. which is what i did for a long time you don't see any actual growth mm-hmm. because it's like you're always like, oh, well, I was growing at this rate last right. time. Mm-hmm. Now I'm growing at this smaller rate. <laughs> right. But you're, like, you're still growing. Uh-huh. <laughs> but to me, I'm like, no, how do I get how do I keep continuing right. to mm-hmm. grow at an increasing rate right. and not a decreasing rate? I think that is like also a, con- a conditioning of American society mm-hmm. on us, too. Right. To always like, have to do it always improving. has to be better than the last quarter. Right, totally. right. Not even the last year, the last <laughs> quarter. quarter. Yeah. Totally. And so for me, I'm like really letting go of that more and more and leaning more into the community mm-hmm. and leaning into like partnering with like creators who I care about yeah. and like and making <clears throat> content with them or not even necessarily making content, making it less about the content and liking it more about my personal growth and then yeah, sharing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember... These, like, ugh, I guess like six months ago, I grew like 40,000 followers. Uh-huh. And the most depressing time for me was when it was actually like during it and when it stopped. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because during it, I'm like, oh my God, how do I maintain this? Yeah. How do I continue to grow? Yeah. Okay, I gotta think about like, then it's not even about your content anymore. Mm-hmm. It's about like riding a trend train. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then when it stops, you're like, I, I should I quit? I, right. It's right. never gonna grow again. It doesn't matter. It's like, Bro, you have so many followers. Right. And you create like, content you don't want to create. Yeah, but yeah. but once you get there, once you plateau, it's like it, you still have all those followers that you're still speaking to. Yeah, right, right. Like, why do you need new ones? Mm-hmm. You have a huge community now. Right. How do you 
um, take care of those right. followers? Yeah. How do you strengthen that community instead yeah. of just growing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what I've found is like when I start to strengthen it, I'm strengthening myself, I'm strengthening mm-hmm. my community, yeah. and those people. This is a byproduct that that shouldn't really focus on because it's <laughs> not the point. But those people will tell other people. Those people will share your mm-hmm. stuff because it's coming from uh, your heart and their heart. Yeah. And they're like, I genuinely want other people to know about this. Yeah. I genuinely want this curator to grow, and I want his message to be heard by other people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I focus on that. I don't really focus so much on growth. It feels good, mm-hmm. yeah. but that temptation to like lean into it, right? It's very is bad. it could could end up really <laughs> very bad. bad, yeah. And that's like deter- deteriorate your mental health, mm-hmm. right? Like right. numbers are numbers; they don't need to be your emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well. We're about out of time. We did link both of your socials, so maybe we'll see if that helps. But <laughs> bro, bro. <laughs> bro. Yeah. thank you guys both so much. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully I'll be able to jump into you guys' session. But, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you guys so much. I think this the people I've been able to talk to through Family Drive has been awesome. So yeah, I appreciate man. you both taking the time. You did a great course, job yeah, too, man. Amazing. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's thank not you easy. So much. Yeah, That's not easy, podcast, dog. Yeah. Hosting is not easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why podcast I, is yeah. rough. I'm yeah. sorry. I've been like bouncing back and forth between the I didn't even notice. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. we'll be back in about five minutes with our final group. But uh, that's about it, guys. I'm just going to... Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you to Ryan and Jeff for joining me on the podcast uh, live in person at the Uprisers Family Drive. Uh, Once again, it was super cool to talk to them and meet them at the Family Drive. And I think they just offer really good insights in the content creator landscape. And of course, not all content creators are created equal, uh, which we touched on, which we touched on a little bit in that interview. So if you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to our show for episodes that release every other Tuesday and give us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. If you would like to support our podcast and help us grow, you can do so with a donation to the link at the bottom of the episode description. To hear more about Changing Tides, follow us on Instagram at LTSC underscore Changing Tides, or check out our website, thechangingtides.org. Let's continue to change the tide on mental health. Yeah.